So in this video, we're going to be talking about Bloch's theorem. Uh, Bloch's theorem. And we're going to be sketching out a, a somewhat non-rigorous proof of Bloch's theorem, more of an intuitive explanation. Bloch's theorem is actually used all over the place in quantum mechanics, as well as other disciplines uh, like e &M that rely on periodicity and symmetry. And fundamentally, uh, Bloch's theorem is about symmetry. It's about abusing symmetry to make our lives easier. And in quantum, in quantum mechanics in particular, we're interested in the symmetry, symmetry properties of crystals. So what do I mean by the symmetry of crystals? Uh, let's say that I've got a single straight line, so a one-dimensional crystal, let's say, and there's just a bunch of atoms in this crystal. Uh, and let's say that you're uh, an intrepid explorer uh, walking along this line of atoms, and this line extends to infinity, so as far off as you can see in either direction. Let's say you're currently at this position. You're at, uh, let's call this position X. And then you move yourself uh, by A. So you move yourself by this distance between the two atoms. So now you're standing at a new atom. So you're standing uh, now right here. And you look to your left, or you look to your right, you look to your left. Do you see anything different than you saw before? Your whole universe is just an infinite chain of atoms. Uh, and so whether you're at this atom or this atom or this atom, you would have no idea. So you would have no idea unless you had some sort of GPS or some, extor some external reference. Uh, you would have no idea where you are within the crystal. And you, in this analogy, is the wave function. Or let's say you're the physical representation of the wave function, so you're the probability uh, or the magnitude of the wave function squared. Um, and this should seem, this probability should be no different at this point versus this point versus this point, because the wave function has no idea where it is within the crystal, within this infinite crystal. And so mathematically, we can write that as uh, the magnitude squared of psi of x should be equal to the magnitude squared of psi of x plus a. So if we go by some distance a, we shouldn't have any, there, there shouldn't be any difference in the probability. Or in other words, uh, at psi of x plus a, we can be only, we can only be different from psi of x by some coefficient c, uh, where the magnitude of c has to be one. Because if we were to put c uh, into here and then take its magnitude, that would just be one and nothing would nothing would change. But we'd like to know more about this coefficient c. What, what form can it take? Well, we know one function whose magnitude is always one, uh, and that's the complex exponential. So e to the j kx, for example. But that still leaves us with the question of what is k, and it's also not clear that this is the only possible form of c. So we're gonna, need to, we're gonna need to do something else to figure this out. And the fundamental trick that we use is we use what are called periodic boundary conditions. Periodic boundary conditions, which basically means uh, we take the end, uh, if you will, so we take the end of this crystal lattice, this infinite crystal lattice, and we connect it to the end on this side. Or we assume that our crystal lattice has the form of a circle. So if we were to redraw this, say with a fewer number of atoms, um, we assume that this has the form of a circle. So this is our lattice. And you might say, well, that's a little nonsensical. Like uh, if I were to walk, so like if, if I were to walk or our wave function were to go uh, all the way this way, um, or as far this way as you can, then you'd eventually come back on this side. You'd come back from the, the edge of this circle. You'd be able to traverse the entire thing and come back to where you were before. And yeah, that's clearly nonsense. Uh, so that's, uh, that's clearly nonsense. So we're making some approximation here. And uh, the approximation is that, well, if it were a finite crystal, that would be the case. But if this were infinite, so if this was an infinitely large circle, 
So I'm just going to draw a really, really big circle. Um, as this gets bigger and bigger, it starts to look more and more like just a line of atoms. And if it's infinitely large, you'll never be able to have enough time to walk all the way around this infinite circle. And so this will cause problems. Uh, this argument causes problems for finite crystals. So causes problems for finite crystals. But so long as we don't care about what's happening around the edges, so if we've got some chunk of semiconductor uh, and we're modeling it this way, so long as we don't care what's happening around the edges and we only care what's happening around the middle, uh, this is not going to cause any issues for us. And uh, we don't have any electrons magically go off one end and come back to the other side. So let's, let's roll with this. Let's, uh, let's assume that we can do this. Uh, so let's just pretend that we're going to be in a circle. Uh, so our crystal, our one-dimensional crystal is a circle. And I've just represented it with a finite number of atoms here. And these atoms are still spaced by a distance a. And we know that our wave function at some uh, location x plus a, so now x is uh, in this direction. It's sort of uh, curvy, but, but that's OK. Uh, just pretend that this is infinitely large, and it becomes a straight line, and there's no problems at all. And space may be curved anyway, so there's that. Or space is curved anyway, so uh, deal with it. Um, so we know that our wave function, we said before, that's just some coefficient c times psi of x. So if we know the wave function at this atom, for example, uh, then psi of x plus a would be the wave function at this atom. And that's just equal to c times psi of x. But then if we're interested in this atom, then we have psi of x plus 2a. And that's just c times psi of x plus a, because we're increasing by another a, or c squared times psi of x. And we can keep doing this uh, for n atoms. And we'll get that psi of x plus n a uh, is just equal to c to the n times psi of x. And so here, uh, our n number of atoms is what? We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So here, n is equal to 9. And as we hop from one atom to the other, we're applying a, a c each time. So multiply by c, multiply by c, and so on. But when we get back to the same atom that we started at, our original atom, we expect those two wave functions to be equal. Or if we apply c n times to psi of x, we expect that to be equal to psi of x. And so in this case, n was equal to 9, so I'd expect c to the 9th times psi of x to equal psi of x. But really, our crystal is going to have a, an n of much larger, maybe on the order of uh, millions or billions. And so in general, c to the n has to equal 1, or c has to be what's called an nth root of unity, which is just the wordy way of saying this. Um, so c has to be some nth root of 1. And all of the nth roots of 1 can be just represented as uh, e to the i 2 pi times some integer s divided by n. So these are all uh, where s can be equal to 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n. So now we just have to figure out the wave function psi of x that when you plug in psi of x plus a, uh, you get the original psi of x times this e to the i 2 pi s over n term. And so if we just try this, uh, so e to the i 2 pi s over n uh, but it has to be a function of x, so let's say x, uh, and then we add an a to it. Um, this has units, so we've, we've got to get rid of those. We've also got to get rid of this a. Uh, and we can do both by just dividing this, this x plus a term, uh, by a. So this is actually, uh, so this is going to be psi of x plus a, or psi of x is just going to be e to the i 2 pi, s over n times x over a. And when you plug in uh, x plus a for x, uh, you will just get this prefactor term out front. So e to the i 2 pi s over n. And the a's will cancel out. And then you'll get our, your original wave function. So e to the i 2 pi s over n x over a. And so this 
uh, this wave function satisfies exactly what we want. But it's kind of bothersome and it's kind of ugly because we don't know n. Uh, s can be any integer we want. The only thing we really know in here is a, 2 pi, and x. Uh, so we're just going to make the substitution uh, k is equal to 2 pi times s over n. And so this is just uh, our new index. And this makes this a lot prettier. So psi of x is now equal to e to the i k x. But is this the only possible wave function? So is this the only possible wave function? Well, in deriving this, we, we, we relied on periodicity. So we relied on plugging in x plus a, and then that's just some multiple of psi of x. But what if we had some other periodic function hiding in here? So hiding next to this e to the i k x. Um, let's call that other sneaky periodic function uh, u k of x. And this just has the property that u k of x plus a is equal to u k of x. And so if we, had, if we try that for our wave function, so we try e to the i k x u k of x, so this is our wave function, and we plug in psi of x plus a, we just get e to the j k a, e to the j k x, u to the u uh, sub k, so this is some index, uh, x plus a. But we said that u k of x plus a is just equal to u k of x, so this is just equal to what it was before. And so this was our initial wave function, psi of x, and it's now multiplied by e to the i k a, or e to the j, as I've been, been using. And so this is the final statement of Bloch's theorem, that the wave function can be written as e to the i k x times some periodic function, which might also be a function of k, uh, and is a function of x. So this is our final uh, form of Bloch's theorem. Bloch's theorem. And this k, uh, we've just treated it as an index, but this is actually the what's called the crystal momentum. Crystal momentum. So it's the analog of momentum in a uh, crystal lattice, or we will generally use it, just treat it as if it's the momentum, uh, because that's generally, generally valid, at least near, uh, near band edges. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a like below and subscribe to my channel. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, just post them down below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Um, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.